There are several institutional structures that promote and sustain modern economic growth. Strong property rights are absolutely essential as people will not invest if they believe their investments are not safe from theft or an unscrupulous government. Patent and copyright laws are also necessary if a society wants a constant flow of innovative new technologies and sophisticated new ideas. Efficient financial institutions, literacy and education, free trade, and a competitive market system are also key factors in ensuring the nation's ability to sustain growth. Four of the determinants of growth relate to the physical ability of the economy to expand. These supply factors, or changes in the physical and technical agents of production, enable an economy to expand its potential GDP. The fifth determinant of economic growth is the demand factor. To achieve the higher production potential created by the supply factors, households, businesses, and government must purchase the economy's expanding output. The sixth factor, efficiency, involves the issue that the economy must achieve economic efficiency as well as full employment. It must use its resources in the least costly way to provide the specific mix of goods and services that maximizes people's well-being. Economic growth is made possible by the four supply factors that shift the production possibilities curve outward as from line AB to line CD. Economic growth is realized when the demand factor and the efficiency factor move the economy from point X to Y. Point Z represents situations in which real output falls below what it should have been if the economy was operating at full employment. This situation occurred during the severe recession of 2007-2009. Society can increase its real output and income in one of two ways. One, by increasing its inputs of resources, and two, by raising the productivity of those inputs. By focusing on the labor input, we can build a framework for discussing the role of supply factors in growth. In this illustration, a nation's economic growth from one year to the next depends on its increase in labor inputs and its increase in labor productivity. By looking at these numbers, it is clear that both increases in the quantity of labor and increases in labor productivity are important sources of economic growth. Between 1953 and 2009, the labor force increased from 63 million to 154 million workers. Productivity growth has usually been the more significant factor. There are five factors that, when combined, appear to explain changes in productivity growth rates. The largest contributor is technological advance, which accounts for approximately 40% of productivity growth. It is generated by the discovery of new knowledge. The quantity of capital explains roughly 30% of productivity growth. More and better plant and equipment make workers more productive. Education and training accounts for 15% of productivity growth. By 2009, 87% of the U.S. population had at least a high school education, and 29% had a college or post-secondary education, both representing substantial increases over the past several decades. Economies of scale and resource allocations account for the remaining productivity growth. Economies of scale are the reductions in per unit production costs that result from increases in output levels. Improved resource allocation means workers over time have moved from low productivity employment to high productivity employment. The long run movement toward liberalized international trade through international agreements has improved the allocation of resources, increased labor productivity, and expanded real output, both here and abroad. Investment in human capital is an important means of increasing labor productivity, and therefore international test scores are an important indicator of future growth. The test performance of U.S. 8th grader students did not compare favorably with that of 8th graders in several other nations in the fourth international math and science study from 2007. In mathematics, the United States came in ninth, and in science, 11th. One of the biggest cross-national tests is the Program for International Student Assessment, or PISA, which every three years measures reading ability, math and science literacy, and other key skills among 15-year-olds in dozens of developed and developing countries. The most recent PISA results from 2012 place the U.S. at an unimpressive 35th out of 64 countries in math and 27th in science. 
As measured by changes in the index of labor productivity, the growth rate doubled in the periods of 1995 to 2009 as compared to the period of 1973 to 95. Economists relate the increase to the significant wave of new technology coupled with global competition. The increase in productivity growth is important as real output, real income, and real wages are all linked to it. It's the main route for improving the standards of living for a nation's workers. This graph reflects the growth in U.S. productivity between 1973 and 2008. Average productivity was 1.5% until 1995, but after 1995, the average productivity growth rate increased to 2.8%. So what are some of the reasons for the increased productivity growth? A core element was the explosion of entrepreneurship and innovation based on the development of the microchip. Microchips have found their way into thousands of products and changed the way business is conducted. Hundreds of new startup firms aided in the advancement of the new information technology. These new firms took advantage of increasing returns in economies of scale as they helped to increase labor productivity. Global competition fueled by the collapse of the socialist economies was another key factor in the increasing rate of labor productivity growth.